everyone welcome so before i say um, more i just want to say that he i would like to introduce him that i know that he is at present employed at a aerospace industry as a principal manufacturing analyst this is what i got to know about Todd and he has been teaching regionally what i say nationally internationally so many people have been uh, there in his um, guidance been growing blooming i would say and he has definitely done a lot of freelance work yes i thought i know this much that you've been doing great job for i think nfl you did for nbc am i right hallmark mercedes benz i i know all this about you yeah. and i won't take much time because i would like to hear we all would like to hear from todd rather not from me so yes todd once again you're welcome we all welcome you and eagerly waiting to know more about you okay. so over to todd well good morning folks thanks for uh thanks for joining us today yeah. um we are going to be doing a run through basically of all different kinds of tools and implements that fall into the category of broad edge or chisel edge pen mm. i know that a lot of you are pointed pen enthusiasts and haven't had much exposure to that and just as you've got not so many choices in pointed pen i mean you can dip into pointed brush and you can use markers and ballpoint pen and pencil to emulate a lot of the pressure techniques but there's all different kinds of chisel edge tools that people have used throughout history to write all different kinds of scripts. So that's what we'll be running through. That's why the lecture is called From Feather to Foam, although it really should be called like Reed to Foam because most of our letter forms began with reeds and not with feathers. But And then we'll go through uh, modern day metal pen points and uh, felt tip pens and fountain pens and that sort of thing. Wow, so, that's, that seems great, Don. Uh, I would like to know more. I think all the audience present over here would like to know more about your background too. Where are you from? And uh, how was it? Like how you started? You won't have so many questions. So I just want to know first that uh, what is your background? And uh, how was your life as a childhood? How you started? Well, I, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico. My dad was a scientist there. And my mm -hmm. dad had taken... Um, drafting classes when he was in college uh, mm -hmm. for engineering and one of the things that he had was a an aluminum metal box that he'd made that had all his drafting equipment in it and the drafting box had india ink um, speedball pen points for pitograph pens an old fountain pen and he used to let me borrow it and play with that so i started back when i was you know maybe 10 or 11 uh, messing around with using the, the pens and I really liked the rapidograph pens that were like, they called those a technical pen. Um, and I used those a lot in college and in, in high school to draw pictures and take notes. And uh, because I'd been drawing in ink, my mom saw a class at the um, art center in our town. Before that, they'd had a class in Paisanki, which are Ukrainian Easter eggs. Mm -hmm. And rather than use the traditional Easter egg tools, I took this little class and we used Speedball B-Series nibs and you'd heat the nib up in a candle and then stick it in a chunk of beeswax and the beeswax would melt up into the candle like a um like a uh so this is this is beeswax right here we'll get my overhead camera set up i don't have it going right now so you take your speedball pen heat it up dip it into the beadwax and then the wax would melt in the pen and then you could draw lines on the on the easter egg the egg and then you dip it in in dye then you'd let that dry then you add another layer of wax and another layer of color but i thought that was a funny use to use speedball pens but my mom since i take in this class at the art center she said you should take this class in something that's called calligraphy i think you'd like it mm -hmm. so usually as usual your mom is usually right right and i really did like that class i was 16 when i took it and um i picked up a pen then and i really never stopped at that point in time so i've been lettering ever since and i'm getting near uh getting near 50 years at it wow amazing that's so interesting that creativity from the wax 
I really, I would like to try that. I think many more will be inspired. Still, we have so many, um, so much of advancement and everything. But I think the basics are very, very interesting. Too yes. good to know that. Yeah. Too good. <laughs> oh wow! What what else uh, is your passion besides um, calligraphy? Well, I the thing that I've discovered through the years that I really enjoy. Um, I was fortunate enough in where I grew up in Los Alamos. It's very close to a place called Ghost Ranch, which is up in the northern part of New Mexico. That's a conference center, mm -hmm. and they started having um, calligraphy classes, a two-week calligraphy seminar there every summer. And I missed the first summer. I wish I could have gone because I missed meeting Jackie Sfarin that was there. Oh, but I yeah. went to the second session and then I ended up going for a 12 additional years after that. Every year I'd go in the summer and I went as a student for the first eight. And then I was actually a teacher there for the last four years. So that really for me was an honor yeah. to be able to do something as a student and then come back as a teacher. Uh, and Definitely. I really enjoyed that. Um, but when I was in college, I was an English literature major. And what I found through the years is that what I really enjoy is uh, the process of writing poetry and doing calligraphy at the same time. So not working so much off of a text or a quote that somebody else has written, but I kind of freeform and write words out of my head. And um, so what you end up with is a kind of a mishmash of calligraphy and poetry. Um, and I think one of the impetuses for that is another one of my favorite teachers, a lady named Nancy Colmoni, who would teach oh. classes in uh, Neuland, was one of the classes I remember. I was really excited to see her the next summer because I'd done a lot of work and I took this one piece out that I thought was really awesome. I'd worked really hard at it. It was kind of outline drawn letters with watercolor flooded in and things. And she looked at it and she said, well, you know, the letters don't match what the words say at all. Oh. It's like, ah, you know. <laughs> But it was not a mean criticism. It was very spot on and point on and was that I had not paired the style of what the type of the, the letters that I drew didn't match the feeling or the empathy of the quote. Um, and that actually was the moment to me that when I reflected on it, I stopped kind of being a, a quote machine um, and started writing my own words on paper. So I've done that more and more through the years. So that's yeah. my passion is, is uniting. I mean, I think our passion should be uniting our, as much as you can, your skills into a, kind of a common set that defines you. You get your own style to your lettering yeah. um, and then you speak your own voice. So yeah. that, that's my passion to me is trying to figure out what's going on. You know, so what is it that I really like to do? Within, it comes within the words, in the, yes. whatever comes, and then you put it in the, artistic form, the creative form. So it's totally your unique. Yes. Yep. That's yep. great. That's great. That's great. Yep. Oh, so any challenges did you face during your journey of the calligraphy? One more time. I said, did you face any challenge during the journey of the calligraphy specifically I'm talking about? Yeah, I discovered um, computer games and actually took a detour for almost a decade playing of World of Warcraft, which I really, really loved because I always loved the Lord of the Rings. And <laughs> for me to be immersed, immersed in this kind of digital sandbox, I just absolutely loved it. But it was kind of a total time sink and you don't have a lot more to show. It's like watching television. You've got memories afterwards, but there's really not anything concrete from it. Uh, so that was a challenge for me. And I actually discovered Instagram back about six years ago. And I hadn't been doing much lettering. And I looked at Instagram and all of a sudden there's like thousands of calligraphers all over the planet, hundreds of thousands. And a lot of them are like really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. And it really inspired me to get back up and get going again, because um, I had just fallen into this sort of inertia. You know, I've, I've done this before. I've picked up a pen. I've written letters. They've been beautiful. Um, and I lost a little bit of that fever. So Instagram and social media, you, you usually hear not so good things about social media. But in my case, I think in some ways it kind of it saved my creative life, definitely, because it brought me back into a community. So and I'm happy to be here today with you folks kind of sharing and giving back to that community. So it's a, it's a, it's a treat to be here. That's nice. Very, very interesting. So uh, whom do you follow? Who is your inspiration as a role model? Well, I think my, my 
my biggest inspiration on the planet is this young Indian firebrand named Aravind right now because he's just sort of uh, he makes sure that everything is fresh and interesting. Like we're going to have a lot of energy in this meeting today because he woke me up. He prompted me with a phone call and then said, we're starting 20 minutes early. So oh. we, got, we got going with a lot of energy here today. Um, but he's really been a, he's been a, an inspiration to me because he's so good with the technology and he's so passionate about letter forms and experimenting and not kind of following what everybody else is doing but also listening to his own voice that he gets back from what he's going on um there's a guy named escrit escritas de bajura who is a calligrapher in madrid that i'm planning on visiting this summer hopefully for a little bit um who does very painterly work that i i really really admire um uh and then i like really admire like nina tran and uh jane um, Ginkgo Arts, wow. I really like the way that they have an online presence and interact with their people and are so kind and encouraging with their students. It's really, when I taught before, it was all a classroom with people in the room with you and, and pens on paper, basically. So the whole, this whole digital world now and all, yeah. all the intercommunications and everything is very, is very new to me and very exciting. So those are two people that I really watch a lot about both their work and then how they how they conduct themselves when they work. So those are some, and then I follow over a thousand different people on Instagram of, yeah. for all different, um, all different types of things. And uh, it's nice to get a feed of, of things that you see inspirational and you never know what's going to pop up that's going to inspire you from one day to the next. So. Um, Very true. I, I think your yes. words are inspiring all of us present over here. So surely, we are all going to look and we do look into each other's work definitely it's very interesting so uh, going on with this that i visited when once uh, when i visited first time your instagram page i found it's written luminosity in the shadows yeah I love it, but i want to listen from you like what you would you please say something about it explain luminosity in the shadows yeah well that's it's kind of a metaphysical or spiritual concept it's sort of i know there's a phrase in the bible that says that you don't keep your candle under a bushel you, you let your light shine out and that all of us as we go through life have our struggles and difficulties and circumstances um, that you could view as being darkness um, mm -hmm. but what's important is is that if there's dark light overcomes darkness basically so when there's luminosity or things shining from within or you can see you can see the presence of god in somebody else another person and then give them grace or look for the bright side of a situation or the silver lining in the cloud that's the luminosity that brights up the shadows or like a letter form you're writing with black ink but that black ink is going to be very static and dull unless the luminosity of the page comes through the letter and from around the letter and then respects its colleague letters that follow and follow and follow for your letter spacing and your in your composition so um it's kind of a dualistic approach but it's also very holistic because you need both you need luminosity and you need your shadows so nice to hear from you your perspective yes i do agree what you say just be positive see the positivity in the dark also you find yes light is there to guide us all okay yes. so now i would like you what we are all eagerly waiting for your okay. presentation your demonstration so that we could learn more about the nibs so so we are here to see all your work the way you work your unique style of working that won't be quite so much today we will do a we'll do a demo sheet kind of of the different pens as we go along i did um work up um a handout for the class so if you didn't get the handout let us know and we'll get it emailed to you that's got little pictures of all the different tools i'll be showing you today and there's also kind of an exemplar sample at the at the end this was what i worked up yesterday but we're not switched are we yeah. here excuse me folks yes yeah, zoom in a bit yeah Are we wrote now? Yeah. 
Yeah, bring bring it with you, Claudio, please. Hmm. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Should have done that ahead of time. I was still in mm -hmm. bed. This is um, also my very first time presenting on Zoom. So, like I was a beginning awesome. calligrapher, a beginning calligrapher fifty years ago, I am today. Wow. A humble beginner begging your patience in my learning. So thank you for joining me on the journey. This is there's a copy of this on the last page of the um, handout that I sent you, and you can see how we can get a really incredible range of marks from one particular wow. type of instrument. Okay, so that's in your handout. So if you don't get that, let us know, and we will email that to you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So I think every calligrapher, when I first started, I had like one nib and one pen holder and one fountain pen. And um, I think a lot of us become gearheads. And uh, so one of the things that one of my first wife made me was what I now call my quiver. Surfboard, surfers have their quiver. So this is a, or a pen roll. So this is a hand sewn pen roll. It's got, uh, it's made from fabric and it's got little pouches sewn in the bottom that have spaces where you can put and keep all your tools and then when you're done with it you just roll that up i think if you want to make one of these they're pretty easy and you can find inst you, anything i show you today you can find out how to do better by looking on the internet so like we're going to talk about quills briefly but i'm not going to teach you how to cut them but if you want to know how to cut a quill pen youtube it also with reed pens it's the same way all right so let's start with the reed pen which was how people wrote a long, long time ago. Basically, they just took a, sh a stick and dipped it in ink and wrote with it. So that could be as simple as this. This was a commercially bought um, at an art store. This is more for writing pointed letters, but this is a piece of bamboo that has a fairly elaborate uh, reservoir. And um, you can just dip this in ink and write with this. I'm going to be using fountain pen ink basically for the demo today. So this is going to give us, I've never written with this pen before either. Okay, that's going to give us more of a monoline style letter. Okay, which is for broad pens, not that interesting. But if you take a reed or a bamboo pen and do this scoop cut on it, right there. So you see how the, the pen that's the been cut away so it's flat on the bottom now, and then taper down the cut on the top. Then when you dip that in ink, then, let's see. Then we'll get some weight on that stroke instead. All right, so there's our classic vertical stroke and at 45 pin, and there's our horizontal stroke and we can make a thin diagonal stroke and we can make a thick 45 in the opposite direction. Usually when you write letters with a broad pen, you scale the size of the letter to the size of the pen. So most of the hands that you'll write, if you, stack, if you turn the pen so it's at 90 degrees and stack up four pen widths, one, two, so the corner touches the corner. That would be the size that you would write, say a foundational N. So the chisel property of the pen allows us to get thin entry strokes, thicker pull downs, curves with gra um, arches with gradual curves that transition like a ribbon, another straight stroke, and then a pull out, okay? If we were to switch and write like an italic script, and let's do that with a different pen, okay? This is a variety of that type of pen that my friend Ed Fong, who lives in Los Angeles, makes. And what he is making is, I'm trying to get a little better light on that, it's a little, I'm going to get up and turn the, oh, oh, let me turn this one on. Maybe that'll work a little better. Is that a little better, a little brighter? Okay. So this is a pen in which Ed takes very large pieces of bamboo. Here's two different sizes. 
and cuts out a flat piece of bamboo and basically shapes that nib. So he's done a lot of shaping on here. First, he shapes the thickness, then he sh sh shaped the width, then he's cut in so they fit into the pen body, and then he's tapered the top, and then he's cut it off square on the top. So this will give us a much larger line. So if we're going to write italic with this particular pen, it's going to make a big letter because italic is usually written at about five pen widths. Three, four, five. Should we try and make a letter that tall? Let's give it a shot, okay? This does not have a reservoir system for holding, holding ink, so a lot of times you'll get more of a thick and thin. So you can tell pretty dramatically from this example how the size of the pen determines the size of the letter, right? So that's a big letter. That's over three inches tall, that particular letter, that A right there, right? So then Ed cuts these pens and then he takes up another piece of bamboo and he splits it and he slides the bamboo into the, uh, into the body of the pen and then wraps it with twine. So that's another type of pen. A simpler one that you can make is called a veneer pen. And I think I, did I pull one out here? What I did. Okay, this is a veneer pen. Veneer is a very thin piece of wood that's used for decorative purposes. So this is just a slit that's been carved into a dowel rod. And then a piece of veneer is cut and placed in there. And that will do the same thing once again. But these pens tend to make kind of dry marks because they're not pooling a lot of ink, once again. <laughs> Another really easy one to do is the next time you go have Chinese food and you get disposable chopsticks, zoom back out here, okay? Disposable chopsticks, um, usually I think it's the Chinese style or Japanese style has this um, flatted off chisel edge. And you can either write with that as is by dipping it in ink. Or you can split it in half, pop and get a pen that's half the size and use that as well. So another, um, concept that's important in broad pen lettering is the relational aspect of this angle of the pen, this being zero, this being 90, this being 45, a little flatter being 30, is the ratio of how this angle of the pen approaches the paper. And different scripts will use different, different, um, different ratios for that. So example, the, the foundational is going to be written at about 30 degrees. And our italic is written about 45 degrees. And for the most part through an alphabet, that's kind of a constant. You'll be writing the same uh, with that same pen angle for, for most things. You do change that pen angle to get variations on your strokes uh, for a little more subtlety and nuance in your letters. Let's bring another light in from the side. See if that lighting is always so difficult because it's the luminosity and the shadows. It's hard to set up, right? Okay. Yeah, it's All right. So another thing that you can do that's really kind of funny and easy. I don't know if you can get these in India, but these are a toothpick variety that are called stimudent. And they're for basically picking your teeth out after you're yes, done yes. eating. And yes, they come it. they come in a package. You can get these at the drugstore in the States easy, but I don't know if you're able to or not. But um, basically it comes, it's some sort of a very soft wood and it comes in a sheet. So it's been um, cut almost all the way through. So you can snap this off in any width you want. You actually could dip the whole thing in ink if you write it to. But what really seems to work the best is if you determine what width you want and then snap that amount off and then tape that to a, like a tongue depressor 
or a uh, the end of a carpenter's pencil just with a piece of masking tape so you get yourself a pen that's like this and you can actually use all four edges you can use this edge to write with you can mm -hmm. use this edge to write with and you mm -hmm. can use the points either right side up or upside down and you'll get slightly different marks from all of them but they tend to be kind of an expressive tool that's that's very fun that's very fun to use and a lot of times the ink will sort of um kind of fill in between some of the prongs and and not the others mm -hmm. So there it was solid even and as you write it gets a little thinner so you get all these like little parallel race lines of letters that are drawn all right so that's another another very easy pen that you can make yourself all right so moving on people somehow you know you know the, the human brain is an amazing thing and somebody found out that you actually can write with feathers, feathers and quills. Goose feathers, um, turkey feathers are usually the best. Uh, and you can sharpen those in pretty much exactly the same double scoop cut that you use uh, for cutting a bamboo pen you use to cut a turkey quether or a, or a goose quill. Um, the feathers, birds drop them so you don't have to kill the bird to get them. Um, they're usually the primary feathers off the wing. They do have a little bit of a curvature to them, depending on whether it's the right feather of the bird or the left feather of the bird. Oh. And that curvature, some will work better for right-handed people, some will work better for left-handed people. Um, you want to let the pens, the, the, the feathers age because they're kind of oily and the, the material of the, the material is kind of like our finger, finger fingernail material. So mm -hmm. as the material gets older, um, uh, it can generally tends to cut better and behave better. You need a very sharp knife to cut quills. Um, let's see if I've got mine handy. I'm not going to show you how to do this though, because I'm really not very good at it. I don't work very much with quills, but they do kind of tend to be the ultimate. Um, they're sort of like the ultimate writing machine. BMW says they're the ultimate driving machine. A quill really is the uh, ultimate tool to write with because you can cut the ratio of the thickness of the pen in terms of the material, um, the thickness of the wall of the feather, you can get an incredibly, incredibly sharp cut that won't gouge into the paper. So you get very, very beautiful hairlines with that. So um, basically the technique that you use when you cut these Let's give one a try. Let's not cut a quill, but let's cut a reed. Okay, so here's a reed. So we're gonna use a craft knife here. Is you make a big, long scooping cut first. Okay, this is pretty hard. Oh, you have to take that off the hand fingers. Yeah, pretty hard, okay? Mm -hmm. So you make a long scooping cut first. That's our first cut, okay? Wow. And you cut down to maybe halfway of the material. And this is the exact same thing you do with a pen, you, with a quill, you make the same scooping cut. Then you come about halfway up and you make a second scooping cut mm -hmm. until the pen goes flat, until the bottom surface goes flat. So see now how, if we turn it sideways, you see the first scoop, you see the second scoop, and yeah. then it goes to flat material here, okay? Then you flip it over and you thin this part down with the taper. Oh, that's for the slit, right? I'm not going to put a slit in this. Mm -hmm. That gets kind of scary. And I don't want to cut myself in real time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now I've thinned that out, but it's also kind of, if I hold it up here, you can see it. It's kind of jagged. Mm. So your last cut is going to be to basically come straight down on this with pressure. All right. I just made a mess of my demo sheet, but that's okay. All right, so this also is um, a little bit too long <laughs> right now. This is just a raw read that somebody sent me. I'm not gonna trim it right now because this stuff mm -hmm. is actually pretty hard, but we can dip that in ink and we'll come back up here on the read and you can see the marks that 
That's a nice sharp wow. chip. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. It absorbed the ink so well. Yes. So let's try that with the quill. I'm not giving any guarantees right here because this is an old one that's pre-cut, but I'll show you this real quick. So, so once again, we can stack up our pen widths. There's way too much ink in here. So let me blot some of that out. I cleaned my desk for you guys yesterday. Now I can't find anything. <laughs> And I have not even had a chance to scroll through the list to see who all's here that I know and don't know. But if if I'll, I'll do that eventually, or if you have any questions too, make sure you um, pitch your questions in and we can kind of answer those in the real time. I don't mind doing that, all right? Um, but I've just, I got a little late start yeah, sure, and sure, I haven't, no, I haven't been able to scroll through the list. Okay, so I used a scrap piece of paper to knock a little ink off after I dipped it here. So now I can get something that's maybe not so blotty. So this particular quill is cut. So the letters are going to be a little bit over half an inch, a little bit over a quarter of an inch tall, maybe like eight millimeters. And this, this quill actually writes pretty darn well for having probably sat in that little can for eight years or something. So I did a TV commercial years ago for Mercedes Benz and they needed me to be the hand of Thomas Jefferson writing out the Declaration of Independence. And I had to write with a quill for that. So that was actually a little bit of a um, stretch for me, but I did get it done. And it was funny at the end because they were showing him like kind of getting bored in the process. So they actually took a bunch of the quills and they taped needles into the end of them and then they stuck them up in the ceiling. So like Thomas was bored and threw his pen up in the air and it stuck in the roof. So that was in that was in one of the off takes. It was really pretty funny. Oh, that's you know? interesting. Now, one thing you can do with this particular type of a pen is mm -hmm. to make a reservoir for it to hold a little more ink. And I thought I had a piece out here. I'm gonna fake it with a piece of card. Oh, it's right here, okay. So another very valuable calligraphic implement is an aluminum can because you can make a lot of different things with this thin aluminum that are really pretty interesting. Um, and the simplest is to make a reservoir for a quill. So if you take a pair of scissors, And you cut a thin strip of metal, maybe maybe two, three millimeters, just like that. Okay, so I've got a very thin strip of metal right there. And what I'm gonna do is bend that in kind of a double S curve. Kind of see that shape? That's not quite perfect, but you get the idea. Then this slides up. Todd, you're off the screen. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Just, thank yeah, you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. When you present like this, it seems a lot of times you don't get to work in the way that you normally would work. I usually work with my forehead down on the paper. I'm also going to taper cut this just slightly at the end. Uh, could you just shift your uh, hand a bit? Yeah. Okay. So I uh, put a little bit of a taper cut on this as well. Okay. And then you take this spring assembly, slide that up inside. Sometimes you have to take like a, a needle and push. There's a kind of a crackly membrane inside the pen and you need to push that membrane up inside to get it out of the way. And then you can take your reservoir clip and you slide that up inside. Mm -hmm. So the, the, cur the loop on the bottom holds the spring so it holds it in place and then the aluminum comes and touches the, the tip back just slightly. So can you just zoom in that particular tip? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, then I got to find it there again. Okay, so there you've got the aluminum that's pressed in there. 
And that'll act as a reservoir to hold um, more ink so you can write longer lines, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you the pro tip that's coming up is how to do that with masking tape on the next series of nibs that we're talking about, okay? So that's the thing about quills is you can cut them, but they're kind of soft and they wear out and you need to kind of constantly keep fiddling with the with the quills to get them cut so they're the um, the right shape and they stay and they stay sharp. So somebody came up with the brilliant idea of making pens out of metal. Um, and I think but which really works. Just a minute, somebody's asking, can we boil yes. those feathers? They're asking to remove uh, the oil. You can, the, the, the method that Donald Jackson talks about is to take a pan of clean sand and you put the sand in the oven and heat it up to like 150 or 200 degrees. And then you cut the tips of the quills off and push them down on the sand and then basically bake them. Um, I don't know about, I'm not, a, I'm not a quill expert by any means and I would defer to anybody on the internet that probably is. Um, I know that Edward Johnson has a pretty good section on cutting quills in his big book, but there's just so much, if you're really interested in, in quill cutting, do your research online. I'm not the person to answer those questions. I just wanna make you, aware that that's a possibility. Thank you. Um, I know a lot of the, the English trained calligraphers like Dennis, Dennis, um, Dennis Brown, and Donald Jackson um, do a lot of work with quills, but I would imagine like John Stevens probably does most of his work with metal nibs and just doesn't mess around with quills. And like Christopher Hannes, uh, most of those guys I think are using metal nibs. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, the next great invention was the metal nib. And those were the metal nibs that I found in a, um, in a cigarette tin in my dad's, um, in my dad's, uh, my dad's drawing box, you know, just like a, an envelope like this of nibs. And as calligraphers, you basically will start ending up with nibs everywhere. I've got more nibs than I possibly can even imagine what to do with. But the basic type that I started to use first and that I'm still the happiest with is the speedball family of nibs. A lot of people don't like speedball nibs because I think the, the ratio of the length of the nib itself is very long. Whereas with the other styles, the nibs tends to be shorter. But the speedball nibs come in um, different, different nib styles. You have your A series, and the A-series is sometimes called the bent nib. And I know Randy Hassan, who's a calligrapher here in the States who lives in New Mexico, who's done a lot of work with speedball over the last couple of years, just taught a class in lettering with the bent pen. When you dip that pen in, you're going to basically get a square if you touch, touch the pen down to the paper. Uh, and you're going to get a line that's kind of the same width no matter how you draw with it. I like to use these pens by tipping them over and using them more as a chisel pen in the other direction. Because you do have at the tip of it, you still have a classic chisel point pen. So that's the A series. So that's a square. The B series has a circle or a disc on the end of it. This is a, this is a B series nib right here. And in the handouts, there's really good, close, clear pictures of all of these different things for your reference, okay? I know that on the screen like this, it's fun to see them in real time, but the, getting the representation is, is a little bit harder. Um, the B series, when you touch it down, is going to make a dot. And it also will make a line that's the same width in every direction, but it's going to have a half of a circle on the end, start in the end of the lines um, when you start and finish. Where they pull away, where the metal's folded, sometimes you'll get like these little indentations that you can rotate the nib a little bit and then clean those up if you want to. These nibs are really fantastic for practicing your monoline Roman letters, which are something that every serious calligrapher in the course of their life needs to practice their monoline Roman lettering and the smaller size, like a, a B2 um, nib. Whoops, I did not put my phone on do not disturb, Aravind. Mm. 
Okay, I'm, I apologize for that. Next time. Um, the third style of nib, the third style of nib is the Speedball C series, which is the nib that I really grew up on. It's a, chisel, a true chisel edge nib. It comes in sizes from a zero, which is very wide, to a six, which is very small. I don't really like the, dang it, I'm sorry. You know, it's amazing how even when you're old and like sort of confident in what it is that you've been doing, that when something happens and it doesn't go right, that it's still like really embarrassing at a heart gut level. It's in, so I, I apologize for that. It's okay, it's okay. We okay. all face our challenges. It's okay. Yes, yep. Okay, I fixed it. I'm sorry. That's my bad. Now I got to get back to Zoom. No worries. We all face such challenges. We do. All right. Okay, I put my phone on do not disturb, so that should be better. I apologize. Yes. The paper I am working on is old accounting grid paper that people used for ledgers back before computers and um, and uh, um, Excel spreadsheets were invented so that you would do a, a spreadsheet manually on um, on this type of paper. So it's set up with columns for to write accounts or information and then to enter numerical values to the cross this direction and then write this way. I like to work on grid paper a lot just because I'm usually writing poetry and not kind of making art as much. Um, uh, it's very nice paper. It's very hard. It takes ink very well. Um, and if I decide I want to add water to it later, it behaves pretty well with that. And I also just have a lot of it. It's a very, very high quality paper. Um, but you know, it's it's like I go to the thrift store and find this stuff and most people would never use it again and not realize that it's really a fantastic paper to write on. And what I like about it, rather than regular grid paper, is that the lines are kind of consistent, but they're also sort of irregular. And you can make a lot of choices about how to size your letters by the lines on here. It's not like you're writing into a into a five millimeter or two millimeter grid. So that um, I do have some big sheets that I bought at Daiso that are big, giant, full sheets of paper with a one millimeter grid on that are really fun to write on because you can make so many decisions about how to scale everything and then still have a visual reference on there. So let's get back to kind of the star of the show for me personally, which would be this, this speedball pen. Speedballs are made with a, um, they have a brass reservoir on the top. Zoom in. Okay, so they have a brass clip reservoir right here, which you can see spring up. It has a gap between the steel of the nib and that reservoir pokes through here and then wraps around on the other side. So the nibs aren't removable. Okay, so they're always on there. You can either fill that reservoir by dipping it, or if you wanna do more sophisticated controlled work, you can always fill with a brush or if you're going to use paint. So I've got a pointed brush here, okay? So I can dip that in my ink. This is also a pointed brush that's not been used in a while, so it's pretty chunky. And you can basically paint ink or watercolor paint or gouache into the side of the nib and maybe a little on the top of the nib in the bottom. And this way you can get more control over the exact amount of ink that's in your pen. So this is a Speedball C0, which is about a quarter of an inch, maybe slightly less. And um, this is a really nice ratio of the hairlines, I think, and the thick letters. So that's a C0. This is a C1, which is gonna be slightly smaller.
And then the last size that I use a lot would be the C2. Let's see if I can find one in the pile now, because I'm starting to get a big pile of pens as we go over on the side. This is a Speedball C2. There we go. Okay. And this is a Speedball C2. I've spent about 10 years of my life writing certificates and place cards and name tags for Toyota uh, for their corporate headquarters, which was up the street for me. And most of the work that I did for them was with a Speedball C2 or D2 pen in italic. So I've got a lot of muscle memory in a lot of years written with this particular at this particular size, which I went off the paper. I'm sorry. Okay. So that's the Speedball C0. The one and the two. The sizes from there down out, the three through six, I generally don't use very much because the steel is too thick and I don't like the hairlines unless you choose to regrind your pen. Okay. Um, but those are the stalwarts that I use day in and day out, okay? Mm -hmm. I like to try and find older or vintage pens. I look on eBay and I buy old speedball pens from them because I think the steel is better mm -hmm. and you often can get a better deal. Speedball has gone to like a blister pack of two nibs on a card right now. And they're usually like three or $4 a nib. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can get lucky on eBay and you can buy a full box of 12 for like $10 and $5 shipping. So that's just a, a tip. I know you guys can't do eBay, right? In, in India, which is kind of unfortunate, but okay. So there are also a couple other brands of nibs or styles. I'm gonna call them styles rather than brands. Nobody else really makes a nib like Speedball that's very unique to them. But another style of nib that a lot of people like to use is like a William Mitchell style nib, okay? And these are much better at the smaller sizes. So this is, this is a Mitchell nib right here, okay? Mm -hmm. If you look at it, it's gonna have that characteristic kind of scoop cut to it and the flat metal. These, the metal is very thin. So the smaller sizes work very well to write with. This actually is not a Mitchell nib. This is made by a German company called Senecan. So these are older nibs that's made by a company that doesn't exist anymore. Um, also, you can get nibs by Heinze Blankert and then Browza, which makes the other type of nib I want to show you, also makes these round, sometimes these are called round-handed nibs as well. Um, but the trick I want to show you with this that to me is was kind of a game changer. The real reservoir for Mitchell nibs is this funky kind of triangular piece of brass that clips on the bottom of the nib with these two little ears that fold up. And to show you how much I value those, I looked for one all afternoon yesterday and I could not find one. There really were kind of a horrible design. They tend to fall off on your work and get paint all over your work and they're difficult to fill. So um, I learned a trick from Alan Blackman up in um, San Francisco, which I just think is wonderful. And basically what it is, is a disposable reservoir that you make from a piece of masking tape. So if you take one inch masking tape, it doesn't have to be the pretty green stuff, it can be the brown stuff. And just like we cut that aluminum strip for the, um, for the quill, you cut a narrow strip of paint tape off about an eighth of an inch wide, okay? So that's gonna be sticky on one side because it's tape and not on the other. Then you take your nib and you lay that piece of tape so that the top of it just touches the flat part of the pen and the width of it goes across the metal curve of the pen. And then you push it down against the top with your finger and then wrap it tightly across, not too tight or you'll split the nib. You don't wanna do that. Then wrap it and cross it on the other side. So see how we've got that piece of masking tape wrapped across the nib there, right there. Yeah. That makes a really lovely little reservoir right in here that you can either dip with or fill with a brush. And then when you're done with it, you can um, just throw it away. You can take it off the pen and you throw it away. I'm gonna trim that little bit off right there. But that's the pro tip from your class. I learned that years and years ago, and I use this pretty much on any pen that I have that's a, not a, um, not a uh, um, speedball nib. 
You can even use this on the browser nibs and that works very well. So th this type of pen is just going to give us the same type of letters, but slightly smaller. Yeah, like that. Okay. Five. So like a round hand with this. All right. So Other type of create a reservoir. Somebody's asking, is it mandatory to create a reservoir in the nib? So once more time. Uh, is it mandatory to create a reservoir in the nib? To create a what in the nib? The reservoir where you the ink can be stored. Oh like no, no. The advantage to writing with a reservoir is you can put a lot more ink in the pen and you yeah. can just write more off. You can write more letters. You might be able to write a word or two with a reservoir. Um, if you dip a pen without a reservoir, like the wood pens that we did at the start, it's going to tend to dry out very quickly. Uh, a reservoir also allows you to maintain a little more volume of ink in the pen. So you're not going to get, you'll get a more consistent um, letter with the same amount of ink on it throughout rather than like a wooden pen you noticed we got a lot of stuff that was very splotchy and streaky and kind of starting and stopping so a reservoir is generally a pretty good idea to use it just you're going to get you're going to get a lot more writing and it helps you to control how the ink comes out of the pen okay. thank you all right now let's see if we can find i don't use browse and nibs very much i listened to Sotwinder gave a talk um, a couple weeks ago, and that's pretty much all he uses. And I went to go find some to use, and I've got to get some because I just don't seem to have many of them sitting around anymore. And I thought I had one out for today, but I do, do, I do. Okay, here's one right here. So this is a, this is a Browsa style nib. Browsa is a German company as well. And it has a reservoir on the top that you can see. This reservoir comes off, it's a metal clip, but it's on there much more substantially than the, um, this, the, than the, the Mitchell press-on nib on the bottom. This one's kind of dirty because I didn't clean it well. You can take them apart to keep them clean, which really helps. A lot of these nibs are made from tool steel and they tend to rust very badly when you use them. So it's, it's important to keep them clean. So this is the little curious little reservoir on the, on the browser nib right here. Um, when you're taking this on and off, you need to be very careful with it because it is sharp. It's got sharp little corners and you can give yourself a pretty wicked cut with, with uh, the sharp steel on the underside of the reservoir. Um, so this will press into a pen, pen holder once again, and you can use this very much the same. Now, the advantage that people like about the browsers, once again, on the small sizes, they're very nice because the thickness of the steel to the width of the pen is going to give you nice hairlines. Browsers tend to be a little more rigid than the Mitchell nibs. The Mitchells are very flexible and will change with the amount of pressure that you put on the pen. Those The little nib splays... Most of the nibs are either, let me get a marker so you can see that a little better. Where'd they go? Okay, so most nibs have a single split down the middle and then a little hole for a reservoir, okay? The speedball nibs at the larger sizes have a double split, which makes them actually possibly a little more flexible. So that's one difference in the two types. The speedballs also have a longer amount of steel coming out of them where the browses are much stubbier. So the browses tend to be more rigid than the speedball and the Mitchells tend to be even more springy. So what you can, the effect that you can get with that, there's a couple things that you can exploit that way. One is to buy, by using pressure, you can make a stroke wide at the start, ease up on the pressure and then thick as you come out of it, okay? 
And there's alphabets like Bone Script and a lot of things that Al Arthur Baker did that, that take advantage of that particular pressure. The other thing you can do is something I call Dragon Tails, which is if you are writing and then when you come out of a thing, you flip the pen up on the left corner and then rock the pen off the page, the nibs, the tines of the nib all leave the pages at slightly different moments and draw their own separate little marks. This would be tick one, this would be tick two, and the last one draws a hairline out. So there's tricks that you can do with the, with the pointed nibs by, by using pressure and release too, um, that vary from, from nib to nib. You also can get the same effect from a browse nib, but you're only gonna get a single tick. Let's see if I can do it. This nib's a little small. No. All I'm getting is a thickness variation. There's a little too much ink in there. And then there's other brands of nibs that you can buy. A Browse makes the round handed nibs, but those are vintage. They don't make them anymore. There's an Austrian company called Tape. Uh, there's another company called Hero. Um, there's several different companies that make varieties of of this of this um, classic William Mitchell style nib that you also can buy, and then there's um, a, a couple other companies that make. There's a Japanese company that I put in the handouts that makes a um, a nib that has kind of a different reservoir arrangement on it, but I've not used those very much. So, but there are lots of other kinds that you can explore. But yeah, that's it. The Tachikawas. Tachikawa's definitely, yeah. So I have a, I have an envelope of this there somewhere, but I haven't used those very much. All right. So most of these nibs were made for um, smaller size writing. Okay. Uh, a lot of what the speedball writing tradition was was writing posters and show cards, which were small displays designs in department stores. So people needed to write larger letters. And rather than using a brush, which took a little more finesse, another type of pen that was developed was a pen that was called an automatic pen or a coit style pen. And they're basically made of pieces of, of metal that are much larger. So this is an automatic pen. They're made in England and it's made of two pieces of metal that touch each other at the end. And so they're bent at, they're bent at these two angles and then they touch each other. Um, and then they've got slits in to help the ink flow. So this pen is that this is a half inch automatic pen. And you're going to get much larger and actually pretty crisp strokes with that. That's a that's three pen widths right there. All right. So they're a lot of fun to write with. So one of the one of the brands is the automatic pen. Um, I was really fortunate to find a set that now I have to be fortunate and find again, but I'll, I'll find it. Um, another variety of pen that is in that same family is made by a company called Coit. Um, and this is a this is a Coit pen, this one with the ivory handle. These are the older ones. They later came out with these red handled ones that um, I don't like as much, but they just feel kind of cheap. Um, there also was a famous uh, Western calligrapher whose name was um, Arthur Baker, who did a lot of really wonderful, fantastic alphabets that had, um, uh, um, he did a lot of twisting and pen manipulation. And this is a Coit series pen that is actually what's called a scroll pen. So it's got the notches cut out. So this will draw a thin line and then a space and then a thick line and then a space and then a thick line. I can't even get this pen in that bottle of ink. So let me find this maybe will work. A good idea with all this writing is I usually use a cover sheet, which is a piece of paper flipped over that I use that you can either use as a guideline when you're writing. It also protects the paper from the oils in your hand. If you get oil in the paper from your hand, it'll cause the ink to uh, not behave properly sometimes. And you also can use this as like a trial sheet to kind of get your pen going and to knock some ink off, okay? This ink is too thick. I'm gonna add a little water to this. 
So this is also this this particular lecture is the um, first in a series of five. Okay. So the second one we'll be talking about accordion books, and I'll show you a little teaser at the end. And the third one, um, I think, is about using speedball nibs. And the fourth one is about using water in your work. So like for right here, my ink was too thick. So I added a little water to it. This is walnut ink. And now hopefully I'll get a better, getting one of the scroll lines there. Here we go. kind of ran out of ink at there in the end, but that's a line with a lot of character. And if you're actually gonna use this, this is a one inch nib. So an italic lowercase letter would be five inches tall. So this would be something that would be good for writing um, large scale poster type letters. This was the antique set that I wanted to show. And because people have been doing lettering for you know thousands of years, you never know what you're going to find when you walk into an antique store. So I saw this wooden case. And when I opened it up, look what I found in there. And what a, what a delight that is. So these are made by a, an English company called, let me find one with the, oh, it's on the brass. These were made by, where is it? Is there a patent number on it? I thought I found, oh, J.W. Stokes. That was the brand of this. And the, the handles are a little bit thinner than the automatic pens, um, but they're very, they're not, they're nice pens. I use these quite a bit too, to draw different letters. And you can always, you don't have to write with the whole. It's a truly a pleasure to the eyes, I would say, your collection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to write with the whole nib too you can always like rock off and use a portion of the nib and automatic pens you also can tip up on the side and write with a portion of it so that you don't have to do the um just solid traditional lettering with them there's also room to experiment with those i when i was looking online about what pens were available right now i did find an indian company arvin can maybe put the name of that up and they have a whole set of like 10 or 12 automatic style pens um, that uh, that they're selling. That looks like a pretty interesting set. I might look get when they look like they're very sharp. Speedball had their own version of this that they called the steel brush. And it's got lots of layers of metal in there. There's probably six or seven little leafed up layers of metal right there um, that all serve as an interior reservoir. And I think these came in like quarter, three eighths, half. Um, I don't know if they made one as large as an inch. They're pretty hard to find and they don't make them anymore. Um, but these are also another type of kind of automatic or wider, wider metal nib that you can make. These you probably could get some really interesting splatters out of. But once again, I only have one of these and I just haven't used it very much. So, but that just for your thought. This was another really fun style that I found in an antique store. And these were all made from one piece of metal. So you can see right here, that piece was folded over to make the, to make the end nib here. And then they, they trimmed it and then folded these pieces around to make the handles. So these have a, and this is called the do quick pen. I don't know when they were made, but uh, so this is a, a larger, larger nib. This is a 10. This is a nine. Um, and then these are scroll pens. This was the eight and this was the seven. So I only have two of this particular set. Um, so I imagine I'm missing like five or six pens possibly out of out of this collection. But that's another that's another variety of these automatic style metal pens for larger lettering. Um, another pen that kind of burst on the scene not too long ago was a pen that the pilot made and it's called, they call it the pilot automatic pen. And I know I took a class in LM script or part of a class in LM script not too long ago. And the theory of these, um, these are fountain pens. They take a cartridge feed on the back or you can dip them and use them. You can refill the cartridges. Uh, but this is basically the same theory on this, which is a piece of metal 
that's folded at the tip that you do your that you do your writing with okay and these pens come in about six different sizes a lot of people love these pens i like the larger size which is the six millimeter pen um but i'm not all that crazy about the smaller sizes. I think the um, the ratio of the thickness of the metal is uh, a little bit too thick. This width of the thickness of the metal of the fold of the metal is too thick, so you don't get you don't get great hairlines with it. Odd. Yes. Um, those are two plates put together. It's not a fold. Oh, are they? Yeah. If you're going to clean the pen, you have to slide a um, piece of film between the plates. Oh, you're right. Yes, they are. But they're also sharpened inward. So like, the, yeah. um, thank you, Kathy. The, um, the automatic pens have bent metal that looks like this. Okay, so you've got two flat surfaces coming together. The Pilot, they really are much more parallel. They're really tight to each other. And then the top is actually shaped at a slight bit of an angle, but these two touch right there. So you're right, you, they, you are right. They are, it is more of a true parallel pen with two parallel plates coming in, so thank you. I think I knew that and I just have forgotten. So, um, the other size, so this is this this is kind of an intermediate size. This is a three point eight. This particular size. One thing I found in the LM class is that there's a very particular mark that they get that you really can almost only get by using a rigid um, a, a rigid automatic type pile pen. And we'll see if I can do it because I'm not that good at it. But as you pull down, you tip. To the corner to the left corner of the nib and pull off to get your hairline so what you end up getting is this kind of double curve shape that happens like this and that's a mark that's very particular to this particular type of nib um, and a lot of the constructs of lm seem to be based on that particular shape which i think is very interesting okay how are we doing for time yeah we can learn a lot from you, but yeah, we need to respect time. I think people are must be hungry too. They want to okay. have. <laughs> I just uh, have a couple. I have a couple more things I want to show you real quickly. Okay, okay. sure, sure, um, You so maybe like five, five more minutes, ten please, more minutes. Please carry on, carry on, carry on. Okay. okay, one thing I forgot to mention with the metal nibs is that when you buy the metal nibs. They uh, have oil on them to protect them so they don't rust. Yeah, that is a question uh, to be asked. I thought I'll ask because how to clean the nibs, that is yeah. one thing which we all worry about, you know. We are all concerned like how to maintain them for a longer period of time. As you can tell, I've generated a lot of dishes for me to do after class today, right? I have a lot of pens that I need to clean. Um, <laughs> when you first use a nib, what you want to do basically is to flame it off with a match. That's probably the easiest way to do it. These are my Michael Soul commemorative Spencerian matches, and I only have four left. So we're going to use one today. If you take a match and strike it, this is too much pressure, folks. <laughs> I think the strip's worn out. I'll be right back. God has got interesting things. I think, uh, yes, time is running, but we are on so much in, involved in it. We didn't realize how much time passed. Yeah, God, it's, yes, yes. Yes, okay. Just, you don't yeah. want to flame them off with a lighter because that's going to be too hot. A paper match is going to burn a little cooler. You basically just pass your nib through this for four or five seconds. And I usually quench it in ink and then clean that and you're good to go. That's going to get that protective oil off. When you clean your nibs, if you're using a walnut ink or an iron gall ink or a, um, 
uh, um, a sumi style ink uh, that can rust your pens really badly. So you want to take them to the sink. Uh, you can use a piece of index card to slide it in between the nib to clean it out. You also can use an old toothbrush. Um, I generally don't use soap when I clean them, but I just try and get them as clean as I can. And then you actually want to dry them. Don't put them away wet or they can rust pretty badly. Um, the green bottle Sumi ink basically just destroys pens. It rusts them out. So a good idea to keep them clean. Um, I didn't talk about pen holders, but all of these metal style nibs need some sort of a pen holder to put them in. You can buy them commercially. There's also lots of artisans that make them all around the web right now. So you can buy nice pen holders. Um, you also can just carve them yourself from sticks. I've done quite a bit of that. Or you can buy a lathe and turn your own. But um, I like to have a lot of different pen holders so I can have a lot of pens going at once so I don't have to constantly switch nibs, okay? Um, I did wanna talk really briefly too, that you've got some other alternatives that you can use that are foam type markers. So these are all commercially available. These are all Zig markers. Um, and these are going to write like quarter inch letters, all different colors. These are super easy just to carry around with you and um, you know, to, just to have with you when you wanna write. Or if you're doing like demos where you don't wanna mess around with wet ink, um, but there's different brands of those. These also have a, on the opposite side, they've got a reservoir that's a little bit smaller or not a reservoir, but a tip. These are made from a fiber uh, um, and uh, they do kind of mush out. So it also will teach you to have a light pen, a light hand, so you don't ruin your pens. On the opposite end of that spectrum is there's a brand, a pen called Copic, and this is their 10 millimeter wide pen which makes an enormous mark. I think these are solvent-based pens, so you can write very large letters with these, okay? You also can just basically use any box type of, of marker. To write with, that has a chisel at the edge. The ratio of the thickness of the nib is pretty extreme, but you can tip it up on the edge and write with it that way. Um, and then the last one that I want to mention is basically using fountain pens. Um, and that has sort of been my go-to through all of the years is I like to have a nice italic tipped fountain pen. So these pens here are Pilot Preras, which is the right price point for me. I'm sad if I lose them, but I'm not heartbroken. And they have a very nice, fine, sharp, metallic nib on it. And the nice thing about these pens is you can put one in your, in your pocket and you're good to go. Except if you don't have a pocket, then you got to tuck it somewhere else. So like that. Uh, then you've got a pen to write with anytime you want and it's an ink quality pen. Um, you also can buy inexpensive pens um, or a pen with a ball on the tip, like this is a this is a Pilot Metropolitan, which has a little ball on the tip of it. And using a grinding stone or a grinder, you can actually grind your own chisel point on the end of those, which is sort of fun. I get these uh, these nibs at Daiso, which are like this is a five dollar fountain pen from Daiso, and it's actually a pretty nice pen. It's made in China, and then you. I take it to my grinder and I grind a new point on it. So there, that's another route that you can go. So, um, and then kind of at the, for the very last, you can also just use something as simple as a piece of foam that's got a block. Anything that has that long edge to it, you can use to write with. So I can put a little ink in a dish. I can dip that block of foam in there and I'm going to get a very characteristic mark that's going to kind of do what it wants to do. But that technically is a chisel edged pen, just a block of foam like that. Okay. So you can write with a broom, you can write with a toothbrush, you can write with a tongue depressor, you can write with a piece of cardboard. Um, Basically anything that you can get to transfer that medium to the paper, 
um, you can write with. If you're going to do traditional formal stuff, then you want to stick with a traditional formal implement, but you don't have to do that. So, um, all right. Thank you, Don. It, 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 it is really amazing to see all your collection, your treasure, I would say. That's an amazing treasure you have. It is really a treat to the eyes. And if and you are using it and we can see all those, comp the, I, I think it's a composition which has come out there on the paper. Wow. Yes. Really yes. Beautiful. It's a complete yes. thing. Uh, you just wrote it and it came by its own, I feel so. Thank you. It is so very informative. Yes, I can see the comments there. People are saying it's really a wonderful session, informative. But uh, there is one question that somebody is asking. Uh, where does one start from? And what are the goals to set when you are practicing this craft? Uh, well, you have to start from wherever you perceive as being the beginning, which means that you can constantly start um, because there's so much to learn. Uh, I think it's best to start with a fairly easy starting alphabet, like a foundational, it's probably the best way to go. Um, or to do like a copper plate, actually, is not really a bad starting alphabet in some things. But you want to start with a single hand, basically, so you can learn to use your tools and to produce those traditional marks and to learn what the letters start to look for. So that's the best place to start. And once you've gotten your feet wet or your pen wet in that, then you can work forward from there. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, they say, what are the goals one should have? The goal depends on, that's entirely personal and up to you. I mean, I, a lot of calligraphers make their living doing this. They work as full-time calligraphers. Um, you can be the queen scribe. Um, you also can just write letters to your friends or learn enough to do your own wedding invitations. Um, or you can do that because you like to write poetry and you want not to get bored when you're writing poetry. You want it to look nice. Goals are entirely personal. So that's something that you'd have to decide for yourself. So we're really fortunate that we have a big community right now of so many people that are interested. And most of the calligraphers that I know are pretty receptive to talking to people and giving advice and pointers. So, um, uh, you know, always feel, never feel free to, I mean, always feel free to, to approach and ask questions and, and to learn because people are really, calligraphers I've noticed in my lifetime are usually really, really nice, friendly people and are always happy to help. Thank you so much. Thank you. And yes. uh, uh, I would like you to share the teaser for the coming up series because I think people know, or if you don't know, uh, dear audience, the participants, I would like to tell you, this is not the only session Todd is with us. He agreed to give us four more sessions. So I am really thankful. And I think we all, the artist community is thankful to you. Calligraphers in India are thankful to you to giving us such a valuable time. And yeah, so, so uh, share, uh, share the teaser for the coming session. Could you pop back to my uh, the overhead camera for a moment, and I'll yes, show sir. a couple. Sure. Okay. Please do that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So the sec the the next class is um, basically on experimental accordion fold books. I had a period back in the '90s where I did a lot of bookbinding, and I kind of stumbled on these. I kind of had forgotten about them, but like this is a book form that's an accordion fold. Oh. Things very interesting, very, very interesting. And I've got like all, I've got this whole envelope. This is one envelope, but I've got a couple boxes of all of these different books that I did. This book, this must be Psalm 121, mm -hmm. right here. So, so many things are coming up in the coming session. Yeah, this will be fun. I've got a lot of like just forms that are blank books, but then a lot of books with lettering in them as well. So safety of the godly who trust in God, a song of degrees. And then here's the psalm that's written out. Oh, that's nice. I haven't oh, seen this in a long really, time. Really, really interesting. So this has a landscape of torn brown paper on it, and then brush lettering, and then little uh, 
kind of italic unchill combinations on it. So that's what I'll be showing you is lots and lots of little experimental book structures. We're going to do a brief introduction on how to fold your own accordion and then how to glue in pieces of an accordion. That'll be a little quick demo that then then you can kind of figure out your own stuff in. And then I'll just show you um, a lot of lot of samples of different things. It'll be fun for me to revisit as well. So I haven't seen this particular book in 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it, that should be fun. <laughs> yes. Looking forward for that. Yes. Thank you so much, Todd. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have a very important announcement for everyone. So I would like um, Imani to join us and uh, please share that important thing which is coming up for the from the calligraphers in India for everyone. Over uh, to you, Himani. Uh, thank you Hi. so much, Todd, first of all. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Todd. Thank you so much, Todd, for such an informative session. No, you're uh, welcome. There, there is a like a quick announcement from the uh, Calibers team. Like uh, Calibers has just started the Zoom rentals. It's like a rescue to you know the artist community uh, because it it gets difficult if you want just to take one or two workshop and you have to buy the entire Zoom. And that forty minute uh, free sessions are like little bit of pain. So yes, uh, Calibers has just started the Zoom rentals. So for more details, you can simply just go to Calibers or the Instagram handle. And if you if you have any query, you can simply just DM us and we'll be like happy to serve you all. Thank you. Thank you, Imani. Thanks a lot. So yes, a uh, slight uh, voice drop was there. So I would just repeat what Himani said that yes, that's a, that's a Zoom uh, platform which Calibers has uh, collaborated with calli calligraphers in India and we all can avail that. So say, stay tuned, do visit our Insta handle and you'll get the updates and visit uh, uh, Todd's Insta handle also. You'll get many, many interesting things there, which I didn't have the time to talk to Todd about, but I'm sure I will take those questions in the coming up uh, sessions. I'm going to trouble you a lot, Todd. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling back through the uh, the chat too. So if I can, I'll make notes and then respond to people sure. if I can. Sure, sure. Always feel free to reach out me with a DM on Instagram. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me, and I'm happy to help anybody out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you once again from everyone's side, Todd. We are really grateful. Thank you so much. Right. You brought you more than I learned welcome, a it? lot from you. A lot learned a lot. I I appreciate one thing, everything from the scratch you started, like how the tools to be made, and you don't need fancy things, fancy paper, fancy uh, tools to write. It's I think it's just the passion. Right, right. It's and the handouts, the, the the PDF handout is is really good with pictures and a little bit of notes on that as well. So please make sure that we. Uh, if you want the handout, make sure we can get that to you, okay? Sure. Thank you. Thank you once again. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable time. Yes.
Thank you. 